Welcome everyone and each one of you to the Pilates Center and to the Pilates Center Teacher Training Program Formal Lecture Series. I'm Rachel Taylor Siegel. And I'm Amy Taylor Alpers. And we are the owners for 20 some years now mm -hmm. of the Pilates Center. And this is the first time in those years that we have um, decided to put our whole lecture series on film for you. That's right. Um, my first experience with Pilates was actually in 1975. I had some friends who were in the Dance Theater of Harlem and they would um, come back to where we were living and talk a little bit about this crazy woman who was giving them these odd exercises to do. And I, I really didn't know what that was. But years later, I learned that that was Kathy Grant. Um, and uh, I also had a couple other friends who had studied with her. So she was the first person that I had thought I might connect with. But then Rachel decided to move to New York City, and she had um, read these articles on Corolla Trier that were in the dance magazine series for a number of, over several months, I guess it yeah, was. Yeah, and years before. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so she moved to New York to live with me, and we decided to take Pilates at that point. And honestly, are not quite sure how it was that we chose Ramana, but I think it might have simply been that she was the one in the phone book that we could get in touch with. So yeah. at any rate, we've always been extremely, extremely glad that we just started where it seemed to be the source and no questions and pretty much just stayed um, working with Ramana and her teachers through the early, through the late 80s, like 87 through 89. Um, yeah, we would go we would study three times a week, minimum, come to the studio and do our workouts that were um, uh, reformer and mat and some optionals before you left the studio. And it wasn't until um, the studio mysteriously closed one day right. that we realized how precious what it was we right. were doing and how precious what we were receiving and we came to Ramana and we said we want more we want to teacher train or we want to at least get as much from you as we possibly can before we leave New York City right and the the man who owned the studio at the time um, his name was Tai Home, so we, we spoke with him and asked if we could have a teacher training program so they literally kind of threw together a two week long program which basically consisted of us having access to Ramana and being able to just kind of sit next to her and observe her really closely and ask her questions and that kind of thing and um, as far as we know that was kind of like the first formal teacher training program that that existed up till then pretty much anybody who had taught Pilates really just apprenticed until they fell into being a teacher at that studio. So we did our two week long teacher training program and passed, passed um, whatever that meant at the time. I don't even really remember. Um, but we did get certificates with Ramana's signature on them, which in, in the next several years really turned out to be quite handy. Very important. Um, at the same time as we talked to Weetai about um, taking a teacher training program, I had also asked him how to get equipment and could I buy a reformer. And so I had actually um, paid him $3,000 for a reformer and we knew we were going to be moving to Boulder shortly. So I figured, you know, that would be what we would use when we left New York. Um, he was never really quite able to um, produce. produce that reformer. <laughs> Similarly to the day when the studio closed, we really don't know what the story was, but we assumed that there was probably some kind of you know, back rent due or something like that. And right after the studio closed, that was when they reopened at Drago's gym. And we were able to find that out by calling Ramana on the telephone, because you could still look her up in the phone book and call her. And she said, don't worry, we'll oh, reopen. Oh, honey. She said, oh, honey, don't no, worry. Don't I'll reopen. let you know when we reopen. Right. We were like, she oh, did. thank God. Thank God. Thank God. So um, at any rate, we moved to Boulder, and we tie found another equipment manufacturer and his reformers were essentially half price so he said he would get me two for the price of one and um, actually only ever really got me one so I wrote him and I said you know for the fifteen hundred dollars when we open our studio here in Boulder we'd like to call it the Pilates Center 
used the name Pilates, and, um, and he said, OK. And that was really how we were able to, all those next 10, 15 years, um, continue to operate as the Pilates Center and, and not really, and no one could really tell us we couldn't, much as they tried. So we had, so a year after the, 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 cert, the training program that we took was in July of 1989, or it ended in July of 1989, and we moved to Boulder in that fall. And um, I went back to New York in June of 90 and was just taking some lessons with Romana, and she introduced me to a man named Steve Giordano. He happened to walk into the studio with a spine corrector, and I said, Romana, does he build equipment? Because equipment was a little bit hard to come by back then. Um, and she said, oh, yeah. And she introduced us to Steve. And um, I told Steve we were thinking of maybe opening a studio. We weren't sure. And he said, oh, I'd love to come out and build your equipment. And so really, that was kind of what enabled us to, to formally decide we would open a studio and, um, and how we would get our equipment. So Steve came to Boulder, and he built all our original first studio's worth of equipment. Mm -hmm. We still have a couple of those pieces today. Um, and at the same time, he was helping us put together our teacher training program. Right. And simultaneously with Romana and Steve helping Amy and I build the program here in Boulder, Steve and Romana were working with now Sean Gallagher in, in New York City and building an almost uh, identical training mm -hmm. program at the same time. Right. And Romana came out, so we started our training program the next year in 91. And Romana came out three or four times mm -hmm. for that first year and a half and um, taught the lectures for us and uh, did some of the exams and put her name, signed her name to the original people who graduated from our training program. The first group, right. So she really helped train us to, start, to teach the work. <clears throat> the way we had been taught the work through her, as close as possible, in our mind still, mm -hmm. to how Joe Pilates created the work to be taught. And that was definitely her belief and her um, stance yes, that she her was going, her commitment, that she was mm -hmm. going to um, keep Joe's work as true as possible to what he envisioned. Uh, in return to life and in the many years that she taught for him and with him. Right, right. Um, so, and one of the things that we felt so strongly about with Ramana, and I think why we resonated so specifically with her, was because she also had been a classical ballet dancer. Both Rachel and I had been ballet dancers as children and up through high school and then Teachers, I, teachers after teachers. that, and, and danced professionally a little bit. And, and we just are very, we've always been um, very appreciative of the idea of form. In ballet, you, you learn the bar, you learn the way a class goes, and that's the way you do it. And it produces the ultimate effect that it's trying to do. And um, I think that it's one of the reasons why dancers in general love Pilates, but particularly, I think, why Romano was, in a way, kind of the right person to carry on the work as a form being a, a dance, a, a ballet dancer herself, rather than, for instance, being a choreographer or a modern dancer, or what a lot of the other elders were more inclined to be creators, creators and choreographers, improvisers. Yes, right. yes, yes, yes. But we did feel very strongly that we also had the great fortune of having. Uh, a couple influences from some of those other elders. So mm -hmm. um, early on, Deborah Robinson Colway came to work with us, and she had been a student of Eve Gentry's, and that very much infiltrated mm -hmm. our style of teaching, not so much the method or the exercises we were teaching, but our, 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 our urge kind of to go more deeply into the work. We felt when we established our studio, we loved, loved, loved Pilates, but we really wanted to teach it with a little more depth Mm -hmm. um, and then later on, Kara Reeser and Kim Hiroche both taught and took our training programs, and they had been students and teachers and or teachers for Kathy Grant. And so we felt that, you know, our, our very classical lineage was also influenced by some of the other lineages as well, which I think gave our program and still does to this day quite a bit more depth and substance. And then around 1993, mm -hmm. Amy and I were on our own. Right. And we taught the lectures twice a year, full out, for another, 
I don't know, seven years or eight years before we took one of our teachers and then another one of our teachers and trained them to teach the lectures as well. Through all that time, um, it was done here in-house in Boulder at the Pilates Center, and it it wasn't until, I don't know, maybe five years ago, six years ago, that we, we, div we uh, grew our teacher training program to then create the master's program for all the teachers who had been through our training program or others by this time and who wanted to delve deeper and who wanted to um, do more sophisticated, refined uh, studying. And so after the master's program, we developed um, a license, we licensed mm -hmm. our teacher training program to a small handful, select people, four, I think, at the beginning uh, around the world um, to be able to teach the Pilates Center teacher training program around the world so that people could, who couldn't come to us here in Boulder could, could um, take our training program elsewhere. Right. And from it's that- It's like the Pilates Center is a little bit of a microcosm of the way the industry has gone. It was small and it was local and people would travel to take a, a training program and then slowly the, the industry expanded enough that people were getting more used to the idea of having it be more convenient, mm -hmm. you know? And so uh, uh, we were always a little, a little bit slow mm -hmm. at wanting to expand, but you know, eventually discovered to reach more people because our mission at the Pilates Center has always been to heal the world through Pilates. Mm -hmm. Just a small little mission, heal the world. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, and we just began to see, obviously, we'll have to expand and we'll have to allow some of our graduates who by that point had been teaching for many, many years to take on the, the job of, of offering our teacher training program. And that's why putting this all on film is such a huge deal for Rachel and me. You know, it's like our baby and we're putting it on film now. So it's a big deal. Yes. And so after we, after we selected a few licensed teacher trainers around the world, we also developed um, host studios who could do the apprenticeship part of our teacher training program. And we would come to them with the lectures and the examinations. So we would still keep our hand in and they would still have part of the source or the mothership. And um, along that time, we um, developed manuals for our training program as well as um, what was I going to say? Well, they're more like workbooks. Workbooks. We're very Thank clear. You. They're more like workbooks. Yes. Which hopefully you have right now in yes. your hand. You will be using in the uh, next you'll hours. You'll be using them, exactly. Um, well, we determined also about that same time that, you know, we needed to create a bridge program for people who wanted to take our training program and then already had uh, quite a lot of experiences as, as being a professional teacher. There's always been the distinction between sort of the classical lineage and the other lineages of Pilates. And so sometimes there'd be people who, um, you know, had been teaching a long time, but really wanted to discover the classical work as well. Um, at the same time, we kind of figured out, all right, then we need to create an intermediate program, which is sort of the first half of what was the program. And um, gives you 450 hours and permits you to uh, take the PMA certification exactly, exam. Exactly. And it, it's pretty, um, it's comprehensive, but only up through about an intermediate level. But um, it's about, comes in about equal with a lot of the other teacher training programs that are out there in terms of um, what's required to start your career. Um, and then still the whole advanced program still exists. And then we added also just mentoring. A lot of people were starting to want to do something on a more personal level, um, had decided a teacher that they really wanted to work with. And uh, so that became another thing that we could offer. So that, so over the course of the 20 plus years of the, of the program, it has really evolved and expanded and produced uh, lots of little children. And uh, now we have <laughs> studios, probably about, 15 studios between the license and the host and the local studio um, and we're, we're pretty excited about that. So a couple other things that we've done in this what seems to us vast history right. of Amy and Rachel and the Pilates Center. Because we're Center. so way too young to have had this business for that long. Thank you. <laughs> was in 2002 um, Kevin Bowen who was the president of the Pilates Method Alliance at the time sent us or sent to us uh, Adams Media which is a big publishing company to write a book and we wrote the Everything Pilates book which we wrote as 
uh, a textbook for our students or other students uh, and teachers of the work, as well as a, um, a how, uh, an understanding of the industry, how to find a good Pilates teacher, what makes a good Pilates teacher, what makes a good Pilates teacher training program, how to do some work at home and what you might need, etc. So we wrote that book in 2002. Mm -hmm. And then the latest, biggest thing for yes. us is that um, with the changes in the industry, we were finding it more and more difficult to tell our graduates where to get equipment. And finally, Kenny Endelman came to us from Balanced Body and said, I have for years been wanting to make equipment for you. Let's do it now. And so we worked for over two years, two to three years, to come up with centerline equipment, which now we can happily say to our graduates, if you want to buy equipment, centerline equipment is it's the best. It's based off of Joe's original dimensions. It, it's smooth and uh, uh, built, feeds into the body mm -hmm. the way we think Joe must have wanted the equipment to do based on having felt those original pieces of equipment in the Pilates studio in New York. And it also we, really enables the flow that is such mm -hmm. a hallmark of the classic work. And that was where we were seeing a tremendous struggle with a lot of the other equipment, which was getting bigger right. and a little um, heavy, mm -hmm. and the parts were getting heavy, and you couldn't really con just work through your workout without running up against struggles. So um, yeah, our center line is top notch. We love it. And I think that underlying all of what we've done, including our mission to heal the world with Pilates, is return to life. And every time we ask ourselves, well, should we do this, or should we change this, or should we add this, we always go back and we read Return to Life, and we think, you know, as best we can, what Joe wanted his work to create and facilitate in the human body. And it's always been our, our path to, as best we can, um, teach that work the way Ramana taught us, the way Joe talks about it in Return to Life, mm -hmm. the way we see on the old films, the archival films of Joe um, uh, working with other clients and actually his own words in those films. And it's, um, it led us into the belief that each teacher must come to that, under, must feel that themselves in their own body, which is why performance of the work is so critical to us in our training program, and will develop themselves as their own teacher using their own um, strengths, their own history, their own kind of intuitive, intuitive gifts. gifts to be a very unique teacher of a work that is phenomenally strong, full, full-bodied yeah. <laughs> in theory as well as in action. Um, and that's why our program for so long has always required that everybody know the entire system from all the way from very basic movements all the way to the most advanced because until you see that really advanced material you really don't know what it is you're actually trying to teach in footwork so we're we're committed to that and we're we're going to cover every single exercise in this filming um, and in addition to that is the form that is the choreography this these are the exercises we are extremely committed to teachers developing their truly innate abilities, truly trying to pull out of an individual the teacher within versus ex trying to make carbon copies of ourselves, mm -hmm. you know? So I think that that's one of the things that our, our program has, has mm -hmm. always st stood for, mm -hmm. is that, you, you know, you, you can't teach this work unless you're willing to go the journey yourself and explore your own process and, um, you know, and, and actually return to life through Pilates. Um, so then I think maybe a little bit about the trademark. So um, Steve came out here and he worked with us from 1990 through 1991, 92. Um, he was the person who brought Sean Gallagher into the industry kind of with this idea, a great idea, which was that maybe, you know, the medical community could get a little more involved and possibly we would even be able to 
bill insurance, insurance for Pilates mm -hmm. under a physical therapist, that kind of thing. So, you know, he, he was helping to, Romana and Sean establish that same program as ours back in New York. And as far as we know, honestly, as a formal program where somebody could literally start at A and end at Z, take an exam and pass, um, possibly the very first two programs in existence. You Wars. know, we'll, we'll, we'll find that out over the years if somebody comes forth and says something else, right? So Sean came in and bought the trademark from We Tai Home probably somewhere in 1992. And that was when he started um, calling people, defend. yeah, trying to defend the name Pilates Studio and the word Pilates and Pilates Method. Um, and he did call us and tell us we couldn't continue to use the word Pilates, but we sort of had About this. About every year. Yeah, we get this call periodically from him, and you know we'd say, okay, you know, send us some paperwork. And we'll, he we'll, never did. But he never really did, and so it went on like that for about seven, eight years, and then um, then the trademarks kind of came to a head, and the and the the case was actually going to court, and they, Sean and his lawyers, came out here and deposed us for several days to ask us, you know, what we knew to be true about Pilates and what the word meant and why we were still calling ourselves the Pilates Center when we weren't affiliated with the Pilates Studio people. And then um, I actually ended up going to New York and testifying in the court case, telling basically that same story I just mentioned about buying the uh, piece of equipment that was never really produced and therefore being able to use the name for what was owed me. Um, and it was, a, you know, it was sad because we really, we really appreciated the idea that there is a form and that it should be protected and that there's a name to this form. Um, it wasn't necessarily defended as the way we would have liked it to be defended. And um, the truth was, it really was already out of anybody's control. But it was disappointing on some level to see that the word became generic after that. And then the industry changed dramatically at that point. It became a completely different industry. Up till then, it had been a few people in New York and a few scattered people up through the 80s. And then in the 90s, when we established, there was a little bit more activity, but still a lot of people underground because of the trademark. And then- Afraid to use the word Pilates. Afraid to use the word Pilates, right. And then in October of 2000 was when the word was deemed generic and within months. It was as if really, truly some floodgates had burst and massive amounts of people entered the industry and it became quite a different industry. And I think to this day, we're still somewhat recovering from mm -hmm. that as an industry. I always talk to people about how young this industry really mm -hmm. is and that we're very, very much at the beginnings of it. And there's still a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done to create it as a much more professional entity that has respect and could be, you know, easily licensed and um, have have a few more of the benefits that a lot of more professional careers do. And Rachel and I have been actively involved with the PMA since the very moment of the loss of the trademark, because in December of, of 19 of 2000, there was a gathering of people started by Kevin Bowen and Colleen Glenn at the um, at Power Howard's Pilates show. studio, yep, in New York. And um, that Same was the man. very first little beginnings of the PMA. So we were have always been there, have always been involved. I was on the board for a long time. We sat on the um, certification exam board. Mm -hmm. Rachel's currently, currently on the- Commission for certification. Right, so we're always actively, actively involved in, in setting standards, raising standards trying to up the professionalism. Our school is probably the first school to ever be licensed by the state as a, as a formal vocational program. Um, that is becoming something that needs to be occurring more readily. And the next step is to work on national accreditation. Um, and that will be happening soon, maybe by the time you read this or watch Somebody this. who's in a very damaged phase of their neck, if, the, if that's a thing for them. But if they're fine, it's great. So low spring, low, 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 low. Start on a one or the lowest you have. And then as somebody gets a little stronger and it can handle it, you could maybe go up one, but you're not going to do this on a lot of, of, of spring tension no matter what. All right. You're going to want to put a nice sticky pad 
on the pedal, and depending on your pedal, some of them are square and some of them are slipperier than others, um, you'll determine that. With the middle cactus, it's quite nice to put the, the um, pad on the lengthwise so that if there's longer hair involved as they open the spring and then close the spring, they don't catch their hair in the spring. Okay, so we tend to put it kind of like that. All right, so Stacy's going to kneel. You're going to put your two hands on the pedal and press it down. And they kind of need to do this because if they're going to be doing this exercise, they better be doing this part as well. You're going to put the very top crown of say, your, you know, do something with your feet. Do a little burn on a perch with your feet just so your feet are a little active. All right, we're going to do about three to five reps. I'm going to see how um, she's doing after three. That's what kind of determines whether we do more. Either we're not, we haven't quite gotten it yet, and one more or two more reps is really going to solidify it, or she's gotten it and she's kind of done. So that might determine that three is enough. All right? A nice setup. It doesn't have to be official, but it does help you get some lift. So we're going to take some arms up to the side. Then she's going to begin basically roll up, standing push down, that same curl, but she's on her knees. So you see that's a tricky moment. So I'm supporting her a little bit right below the ribs, and I'm helping those hamstrings stay active, activated so that she doesn't just, can you do a quick stick your butt out and fall back? So she doesn't kind of just lean back. So she's up and she's curled. Now another great place to partner is to hold on to these ankles. Mm -hmm. Scooch up and then lower yourself down so the teacher can have their arms here. And so as she tips back, her feet are going to come, mm -hmm. and I can support her as she slides and determines where to be. And we want to err more towards being on her upper back than not, so that her upper abs can engage and her neck is not uh, con uh, constricted. Okay, we want full airflow and blood flow through that area. All right. So. The helicopter, tummy in, brings the knees to the center and legs up, okay? She's going to split her legs, one to the front and one to the back. Now you can do this in Pilates V, so she's slightly turned out. And then keeping that slight turn out, not adding to it, she's going to open the legs into a circle around re to the opposite side and exhale, bring them together up at the center. And then she's gonna Direction. reverse. So as she inhales, her straight arms are gonna come up side by side and over her head, and she's gonna feel this whole length of abdominal muscles stretch taut. She exhales, she brings the circles, palms facing the ceiling and back down to the hips facing each other. Two more times, in with the air. All this scoops and it is lengthy and taut. Exhale, hot and full. So with the barrel shaping her and letting her one more time, inhale and rest upon it, I can assist her here, take her clavicles, take her whole shoulder girdle and tug her ribs and therefore her spine ever so gently up and over. I'm not gonna let her go quick. I'm gonna keep with her as she circles around and comes back down to her hips, exhaling. Then she's gonna reverse it. So she inhales around. You notice her shoulders stay close to the barrel throughout. Exhale, hot and full. Good. She inhales through the nose, down into low lungs, mid lungs. Inhale, reach over. Tummy curls and erects your posture taller than you started. Inhale, stretch and open. And if you wish, you can take your arms out to the side, bring elbows to ears, and reach back up. Good. And we do three. And in this exercise, we do three of every piece. All right? The next movement we do is bend this knee and turn it into what's called an attitude position. The knee is directly in front of the hip. Foot is pointed and energized. Hips and pelvis are still square. You might notice we have a towel laying over the barrel because there'll be a moment pretty soon when she's going to slide. And because she is bare legged down here at the bottom, she'll be a sticky, kind of like in semicircle when you are sticky. So we're going to let this towel help her here. So we'll do one without arms. Inhale, round and curl. Tummy lifts you up. Exhale. <laughs> And then, um, and then at the end, we'll show a uh, more advanced variation. All right, so she's going to start with her legs up at 90. 
And as she inhales, she's going to bring her legs together over her face, and she's going to try to keep some part of her on the barrel because that is stable and also demands that she bend her spine. Then she opens as wide as the pole system, which is shoulder width. She rolls her spine back down on two, and the legs stay apart and go as far as they can with the barrel supporting her. Comes together, tummy in, curl the tail through the inner thigh, and roll, pulling the barrel into you so you stay on, open. Nicely done, Paula, roll it down. Good, feel the stretch all the way up here, and third time. In with the air, curl the tail through, lift the hamstrings up so the hips are up, right, just like you would any hip over the face exercise, and legs together. Then we're gonna reverse it. We're gonna open about the same width. You're gonna come to a point where you feel a little junction, okay? That's where the collarbone meets the acromion process, which is the very edge of the spine of the scapula. So you have a collarbone and then a joint where it meets the scapula via the spine. So you see the spine of the scapula is this big piece that wings out from it. So you follow your collarbone and you feel that junction, place where a lot of people get dislocations and then follow it back and see if you can trace that sharp edge, which is not really the top of your shoulder blade, but it's the spine of your shoulder blade. And all of your rotator cuff muscles surround that spine. So that's a really great place to have really good tactile sensations around that, right? And then you have your 12 ribs right here, the solar plexus. Take her toes and arches and draw the towel up underneath along the mat towards her uh, heel. And I'm going to help her. And you will see that as she continues, the towel should come evenly right to left. And both feet should be working equally as, much, as best as possible. And she pulls as much of it as she can. The beginner will do a lot with the toes and that's okay. As they get more experienced, we would like more from the arch as well as the toes. So she's pulled the towel in, and now she's gonna reverse it. So she's gonna come down on the pads of her toes. She's not gonna curl under and put her toenails down on and flick the towel away. She's actually gonna try and put the pads of her toes, arch her foot, and put the pads of her toes on the towel and then slide the towel away from her, and then again. Yeah. Strengthened as well as the arm and under the arm into the chest. And then we turn them to the other side. Mm -hmm. Does that feel okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, the magic circle is parallel to the floor. Drop your elbow just a hair. Drop your elbow down a little bit. Right. And then she presses with her palm. Right. And all these muscles in here work to withstand it. Good and enough. Nice, so that's front and side. Now we're gonna go to the wall where she's gonna put it behind her, three to five reps. Come on back if you would. We're gonna place it against the wall, here maybe. And this part is gonna go right above her occiput. So come stand Margaret back. Good, and the teacher can hold it either here or against her head, so she, and she can hold it as well, bringing her hands back so she feels very secure that's not gonna slide because she's gonna be leaning like a plank. From more spring for the spring that's already in the head harness. And then the strap that comes from gets put around the forehead above the ears, and the teacher can help with all that. We've put a, a a little piece of paper towel in there for uh, sanitary sake or um, so people who are sweaty don't sweat into the black strap, stuff like that. So you can do that. Um, Leah is holding it herself, which is how you want to teach your clients to do, but the teacher can also stand right there with it and hold it for her. So I would wrap my hands around and I might, I might wrap my uh, left hand and hold this so that she feels very secure as she lunges forward, inhaling big time and exhaling back. So from heel to head, like one piece of steel. Yes, resist coming home so the spring really hold brings you up, but that's where it focuses. Okay, um, it's uh, 
let's just go. So she's going to hold the beanbag out uh, parallel to the floor, straight elbows about shoulder height, okay? And she's going to, the string is going to be lowering the bag down. So she's going to flare one hand back, grab hold, and then roll it forward. Mm -hmm. And as she continues, we try our best to keep our elbows straight and parallel and to make as big a movement as possible with the fingers and the hand. So we try and flex it back as much, open the fingers as much, grasp as much, right. So this is called beanbag one because we're not going to demand the whole range of the uh, uh, rope from her, which is six feet, and beanbag two, when we see it later on, will be standing on a low chair. And now let's reverse it. Breathe.